Good morning, everybody. Please do sit down and uh, reach back for your Bibles, if you would, uh, and turn to page 741. You'll find Daniel 4 there as we pick up the reading from a few moments ago. Let me just add my welcome to Maddie's. It's great to have you with us. Uh, I know people visiting us from outside of town and people in town with us for the very first time. We're delighted that you're here this morning. I hope you feel very welcome among us. You can stick around at the end and make yourself known to us. I'm going to read in just a few moments from Daniel chapter 4, starting at verse 19. But before then, I'm going to lead us in prayer. I've been thinking all morning how you are almighty, Lord God. And so we pray that in your power, you would work in us this morning by your spirit. Thank you that you want us to know you. And thank you that you promise to work in us through your word and by your spirit to bring us to know you. And so we pray that you do that work this morning, that we might know you deeply and fear you properly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me read them from uh, verse 19 to the end of the chapter. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, my lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in which was food for all under which beasts of the field found shade and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived it is you O king who have grown and become strong your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth and because the king saw a watcher a holy one coming down from heaven and saying chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree. Your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power, as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. While these words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox and his body wet with the dew of heaven until his hair grew as long as eagles' feathers and his nails were like birds' claws. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? 
At the same time, my reason returned to me. For, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me and I was established in my kingdom and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Please do keep that open in front of you. You might want to turn back to the first page of the reading. There's also an outline, as there always is, on the back of the notice sheet that it might help you to follow along. Well, our subject this morning is one that has um, fascinated and indeed seduced people in every age of human history and in pretty much every culture, I think, in politics. You'll find millions spent by people trying to secure it on the streets. Criminals will shed blood, tr- shed blood trying to keep a hold of it as well. Uh, It can destabilize boardrooms and dressing rooms. It can shape the dynamics of our living rooms and our friendships, even our churches. We're thinking about power. Lord Acton said famously, didn't he? Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Abraham Lincoln said nearly all people can understand adversity. But if you want to test someone's character, give them power. And they could have been talking about the central character in Daniel 4. King Nebuchadnezzar was a man with the kind of power of which many dream, but very few ever experience. You could argue, I think, he was the most powerful leader in human history. He's certainly up there. But we're going to see that this is a chapter not about one king, but two. Uh, It's been called A Tale of Two Kingdoms, and its central message is Nebuchadnezzar's own confession that the real eternal power in the universe belongs to another. Um, You'll have seen the the chapter takes the form of a press release. It's a public letter from Nebuchadnezzar to the whole world. In uh, chapter three, he demanded that the nations join together in worshiping, bowing down to his image. Now he's wanting to tell them about God's work in his life. He is a changed man. And uh, his story is bracketed by these two poems or songs. There's one in verse three, as Nebuchadnezzar speaks of the Most High God and says, how great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion, his rule endures from generation to generation. And then at the end of the chapter in verse 34, he blesses the Most High God, praises and honors him as the one who lives forever. And again says his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to his will among the host of heaven, among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? So Nebuchadnezzar will end the chapter honoring the king of heaven, but it will take him a while to get there. And we're going to follow his journey to faith. Very simply this morning in our two points. First, the arrogant folly of a mighty king. The arrogant folly of a mighty king. Uh, There's no denying his greatness is there. We get a flavor of it in verse 29. He's taking a stroll on the roof of his royal palace and he says, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. Uh, Apparently, Time Out magazine do a survey every year to discover which city deserves the title of the greatest city on earth. Uh, Any guesses who won in 2022? Edinburgh. Um, Guess who came fourth? Glasgow. Now that tells you, I think, everything that you need to know about the survey and probably not very much about Edinburgh or Glasgow. But if the survey had been done in Daniel's time, there would have been No argument at all. Babylon was far and away the most magnificent city on earth. The visit would have definitely been on your bucket list. You would have gone there in your gap yard. And Nebuchadnezzar deserved much of the credit for its greatness. He developed this city that was virtually impregnable, um, surrounded by a deep moat. It had these amazing double walls that were about 40 feet high, wide enough to ride a chariot on. There were great towers everywhere, and not just strong, but beautiful. 
Um, the story went that Nebuchadnezzar's wife, Amethyst, had grown up in the mountain region uh, away from Babylon. When she moved to the plains of Babylon, she missed the hills and the waterfalls. And so Nebuchadnezzar decided just to recreate the mountains and the waterfalls to cheer her up, and hence the city's famous hanging gardens, one of the wonders of the ancient world. In Babylon itself, Nebuchadnezzar, we're told, had three vast palaces. Um, his main royal residence was about the size of seven football pitches. Uh, the whole city was incredible. There were temples everywhere. It was a celebration of Nebuchadnezzar and his gods. Out beyond the city was the empire that he'd built. If ever a world leader had reason to feel pleased with himself, it was the mighty king. Nebuchadnezzar. He was a man at ease with himself and at ease with life. As verse 4 puts it, all he really ever had to do each day was to enjoy his prosperity. So I picture him sipping on a whiskey or something, puffing on a fat cigar there in verse 30 as he congratulates himself for everything that he has achieved by his own might and power. But you'll have spotted that hint more than hint, isn't it, of arrogance, as I read verse 30, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty. Uh, it's even clearer when we compare what Nebuchadnezzar says here with the word that God had spoken to him in chapter 2. If you were to flick back a page to chapter 2, verse 37, Daniel was interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's last dream, and he said, You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory. So you'll see the contrast. God says, All of the greatness and glory that you possess is a gift from me. And Nebuchadnezzar says, No, it's not. It's all my own work. Um, I turned on the TV a while ago, come dine with me was on. I don't watch it very much, I confess. I was about to turn over. Um, the hostess asked one of the guests to say a prayer before their meal. That seemed unusual, so I listened to hear what he would say. Dear God, we paid for all this food ourselves, so thanks for nothing. And that was Nebuchadnezzar all over taking personal credit for the things that God had generously given to him. And even if we'd never say it so bluntly, I suspect that we all know that the same attitude, or at least seeds of it, can lie in our own hearts as well. Um, God says in the book of James in the New Testament, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights. But have you ever found yourself wanting to, to take the gifts and ignore the giver, wanting to enjoy receiving praise for yourself for the things that he's enabled you to do? Has anyone ever stumbled into thinking that we're better than someone else because we've had better exam results or better looks or more money than they do? Or look down on someone who hasn't had the same opportunities as us, or doesn't have the same physical ability or the same social skills as us? Have we ever sought glory for ourselves, for our achievements, rather than given it to God? There is at least a little bit of Nebuchadnezzar in each one of us. But I want to push a little deeper and suggest that his attitude is not only arrogant. I want to say, well, you tell me if you think that insane is too strong a word. Um, think of what's already happened in Nebuchadnezzar's life by this point. I mentioned chapter two. Daniel in interpreted this dream for the king. Uh, his response to Daniel was, surely your God is the God of gods, uh, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries. In uh, chapter three, this was Nebuchadnezzar's conclusion when God intervened miraculously, we saw last week, to save Daniel's friends from the fiery furnace. He said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has delivered his servants. He said, there is no other God who is able to save in this way. So already by this point in Daniel, God has revealed to Nebuchadnezzar more of his own power 
and authority than many people learn in a whole lifetime. And yet here he is on his palace roof, cigar in hand, ignoring God's goodness and praising himself for his own majesty and power. I'd suggest it, it, he's actively trying to pick a fight with God. The events of chapter four itself paint him in even worse light. It starts with this terrifying dream. Another one, verse five, I saw a dream that made me afraid. He says, as I lay in my bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. It's like an action replay from chapter two. Once again, all of the wise men of Babylon are paraded in, but they can't explain the dream. So it's down to, to God's man, Daniel, to interpret it. And the dream we know is of this great tree. It's in the midst of the earth. Um, it's so tall that just like the Tower of Babel, its top reaches to heaven. It's visible to the ends of the earth. The leaves of the tree are beautiful. The fruit is abundant. It provides food and shelter for all the beasts of the earth, all the birds of the uh, but then this holy one comes down to inspect, just as God came down to inspect the Tower of Babel, the words are the same. And this holy one orders that the tree be chopped down and that its branches be removed, its leaves stripped, its fruit scattered, the shelter destroyed. All that's going to be left is this stump. And somehow this stump is a man who is going to be dehumanized. His mind is going to be made like an animal's. His home will be with the beasts. That's the dream that alarms Nebuchadnezzar. And in verse 19, it alarms Daniel too, but for a different reason. Nebuchadnezzar was scared because he didn't know what it meant. Daniel was scared because he did. He says, I wish this dream was for one of your enemies. Because the great tree, all the beauty, all the abundance, that's a picture of you, Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 22, it's you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven. Your dominion to the ends of the earth. But, says Daniel, this holy lumberjack is coming. And the tree is going to be chopped down. And it's going to be destroyed. And just a stump is going to remain. And king, that stump is you as well. Because though you were once like a tree that provided home and food for animals, now you're going to live among the animals for real and you're going to share their food. And you're going to stay like that, says the end of verse 25, until you know that the Most High rules the kingdoms of men and gives them to whom he will. The application to Daniel's little sermon is in verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins. Start practicing righteousness. Get rid of your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed. There may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Change while you can. It's a moment of high tension. But the most high God has, has parted the heavens to give this great king a personal warning about his arrogance. It's time to repent, Nebuchadnezzar. It's time to realize that every gift that you have is from my hand. Well, how do you think that Nebuchadnezzar would respond? What would you do if a warning like that came to you? Then you expect to find Nebuchadnezzar on his knees, repenting of his arrogant presumption, surrendering his life to the most high God and pleading for mercy. But as we look at verse 29, it is fully 12 months later, 12 months later. And despite all of that re revelation, all of those warnings, nothing has changed. And Nebuchadnezzar in his heart is still locked in his own arrogance. So I think of verse 30 as the, the greatest, the moment of Nebuchadnezzar's greatest insanity in the chapter. I don't know if that's fair. We'll see him turned into a cow and eating grass in a few verses time. But do you not think this is worse? With all of his faculties intact, how delusional do you have to be to ignore the most high God when he commands you to repent? God's word says man is destined to die once after that to face judgment says God is patient towards us, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
Jesus himself said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. It would take a strange kind of madness, don't you think, to do a Nebuchadnezzar, to carry on with life as though God has not spoken and as though judgment is a myth. Our first point this morning, the arrogant folly of a mighty king. Second, the eternal rule of the most high God, the eternal rule of the most high God. Um, reflect with me for a moment on God's kindness to Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know how patient you are as a rule. God's patience, I think, is every bit as astonishing as Nebuchadnezzar's arrogance. Uh, again, we remember the backstory. Chapter 2, God had revealed himself to be the God of wisdom and might. Remember, no one knows the future but God. No one controls the future but God. In response, Nebuchadnezzar says, Truly your God is the, the God of gods and the Lord of kings and then proceeded to forget about him completely. But God didn't give up on him. Chapter 3, God reveals himself to be the God of salvation. He rescues Daniel's friends. In response, Nebuchadnezzar says, if anyone ever says anything against the God of Israel, they'll be torn limb from limb, because there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. And then proceeded to lift up his heart against God. And yet God still didn't give up on him. Now again, chapter four, another dream, another warning, another 12 months of divine patience. Still nothing but arrogance. And so this last kindness from God, a severe kindness to be sure, as the king is brought down. But a necessary kindness because Nebuchadnezzar was so lost in his own pride that it was only when he was brought this low that he was willing to lift his eyes to heaven and acknowledge God as the only true king. We're learning a lot about God's power and kingdom in Daniel, but one of the ways that you get to know someone is by seeing the way that they use the power that they have. And God is using his patiently to save, even the most unlikely, even the most arrogant, even those who claim the glory that rightly belongs to God for the achievements in their life. God's patience with Nebuchadnezzar is off the charts and with us too. He's been far more patient with all of us than we deserve, to be honest. He's even brought us here today to teach us again about his sovereign power, to, to warn us of the danger of steadfast arrogance against him, and to call us to turn back to him in repentance. God is wonderfully patient, but there is a limit. Let's not make the mistake of presuming upon God's kindness. Let's not confuse it with a kind of a weak indifference to our sinful arrogance. But there's no doubting the main lesson that God has for us this morning. You'll see it in verse 17. This is why you're going to be brought low, Nebuchadnezzar. It's to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdoms of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. That same purpose, repeated verse 25, you'll be brought low till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Again, verse 26, you'll get your kingdom back from the time you know that heaven rules. Again, verse 32, you'll behave like an animal until you know that the Most High rules. So what God wants is for all of the living, us included, to know that he is king. And here in Daniel 4, he is going to some lengths to prove it. And the medics will tell you that boanthropy is a, a recognized but rare medical uh, condition in which the patient is convinced that they are a cow or a bull. Um, so they do start drinking water out of puddles and can't see grass without salivating. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is first struck down and then has his kingdom restored. All of it just as God says, and all to prove to him and to all the living that the Most High rules. It was the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar needed, 
Nothing short of this brought him to his senses. And finally, he was willing to admit it. And the change in his heart was every bit as miraculous as the change to his mind and appearance. In verse 30, the king, can't, his eyes can't see past his own glory. In verse 34, finally, he lifts his eyes to heaven. It is a deeply symbolic moment. He lifts his eyes to heaven. His reason returned. He blesses the Most High, prays and honors him who lives forever. This is personal repentance. This is true conversion. It means that if you are a follower of Jesus, one day you'll be able to ask Nebuchadnezzar all about it in heaven. And what finally made the penny drop. So the king's conversion is proof of the king's confession. His conversion proves what he says. The book of Proverbs says that the king's heart is like a stream of water in the hands of the Lord. It says that the, king can, the Lord can turn a king's heart whichever way he wishes. And so here God reaches down from heaven, as it were, into the palace of a supreme dictator and changes his heart forever. It's what prompted Nebuchadnezzar to write his press release. Because when you know God truly, then you find you want everyone else to know him as well. So I wonder if you've come to know this truth that turned Nebuchadnezzar's life upside down. It's foundational to our view of ourselves, of the world, of human history. It's the antidote to self-exalting pride. It's there again in verse 34. It is God whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. Not Vladimir Putin's, not anyone else's. It is God whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. None can stay his hand. Or say to him, what have you done? He rules. He rules. One uh, final detail to highlight as we draw to a close. I'm just going to glance again at, at the end of verse 17 with me. Do you see where it says the most uh, high rules the kingdom of, of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men? Uh, those last few words point us forward to another king, one who couldn't have been more different to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's MO in life we've seen is to exalt himself and to put others down. Jesus chose to humble himself so that others might be exalted. He describes himself as gentle and lowly in heart. And he could have built for himself the grandest of palaces, but that wasn't his style. He said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He could have clicked his fingers and commanded millions of heavenly beings to come and celebrate his glory rightly. He chose instead to be despised and rejected. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He was smitten by God. He was afflicted. He endured far worse than eating grass for a season. He chose to, to drink the cup of the Father's wrath. And he did it for people like us. For we're all a bit like Nebuchadnezzar. We've all, like sheep, gone astray. We've turned every one of us to our own way. But the Lord laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. He is the lowliest of men who has been given the rule of the entire universe. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to me, he said. But don't confuse his humility with weakness. He has the greatest kingdom. He says, my kingdom will be like a mustard seed. It will start really small. It will grow and grow until it's the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, just a little picture of the perfect kingdom. So as we read about God's kingdom here in Daniel, we're really learning about Jesus. We're learning about a humble one, a lowly one, who has an everlasting dominion. 
He is the one who does what he wills among the inhabitants of earth. He is the one before whom every knee will bow. And so we are left with two different ways to respond to him. The way of old Nebuchadnezzar, defiant, arrogant, self-exalting, rejecting God's word and chasing a life of pleasure and prosperity. And then there's the way of new Nebuchadnezzar, finally chastened, finally realizing that everything I own and every talent I possess is from God and delighting to praise and honor Jesus as the Lord who lives forever and gives us every good thing. It's old Nebuchadnezzar and new. I wonder which represents the way that you're currently living in God's world. And I wonder which represents the way that you want to respond. I want to encourage all of us this morning to lift our eyes to heaven, to recognize who's really on the throne, to praise and honor our king, and then to join with Nebuchadnezzar in telling the whole world about him. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we do want to thank and praise you again for your sovereign rule. For your power. For setting on the throne of our universe, the lowliest of men. A humble king who chose to be humbled so that we might be exalted. Thank you for the patience that you've shown to each of us in our life. Thank you for the generosity that's given us so many good things. And we pray that you would help us deep in our hearts to learn the lesson of Nebuchadnezzar, to lift our eyes to heaven, and to acknowledge you as the one who is good and on the throne. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.